Welcome to Redbeard and the Den of Tools. Howdy ho guys and gals, I'm Red, your friendly neighborhood tool bear, and today we're here to talk about a brief history of ye old harbor freights. Yeah. You know, we've talked about them enough on this channel. It's about time we talked about who they are and where they came from. Let me just take this moment to tell you about our sponsor, The Home Distiller's Workbook, Volume 2, How to Brew Beer. This weekend, it's available as a free, free as in beer, download from Amazon.com. Link will be in the video description below, just down there, right, right down there, just click below the video. Harbor Freight was founded in 1977 in North Hollywood, of all places, as Harbor Freight Salvage. All right. <laughs> Who's surprised? <laughs> it was founded by Eric Smith, age 17, and his father, Alan. They were a mail order only store that sold primarily liquidated tools. Yeah, that is tools that were like returns or their stock overruns or they didn't meet, you know, some standards. So they were sold to liquidators who then turned around and sold them via mail order. Well, Eric quickly learned, you know, a lot about the tool business. And one of the things he realized was that at least he felt that tools were really overpriced. And that was because of, quote unquote, the middleman who was inflating the prices of the average working man's tools. So he changed their business model and began to sell directly sourced tools. So what they did was they contracted with manufacturers, mostly in China, and sold these tools direct to consumers. And this is the business model that they've been running till this day. In fact, here's an ad that ran in Popular Mechanics back in the 80s. In 1980, Harbor Freight opened their first retail store in, of all places, Lexington, Kentucky, doing, guess what? Liquidating their own returns. Yeah, their first brick and mortar was nothing more than a, a, a small outlet store selling off their own returns. Kind of, uh, you know, completing the loop, if you will. In 1985, they changed the name of the store to the name we know today. And that is Harbor Freight Tools. Quality tools, lowest prices. Eric Smith was then named president at age 25. And he moved the offices to Camarillo, California. Sorry if I can't pronounce that right. By the late 80s, they had 11 stores across the U.S. In 1997, they launched their first website. <laughs> it looked a little something like this. Oh, wow. <laughs> Talk about old school websites, huh? In 99, Eric Schmidt was named CEO. And by that time, their website looked a little bit more like this. Moving on until 2005, 2006, when the economy hits a brick wall, and unlike many other stores that were forced to downsize, Harbor Freight doubled down, went into some serious debt, and managed to pull through on the high side, no less. 2010, they moved their headquarters to Calabasa, California, where they currently reside. Just to recap those store numbers, from 1980 to 1990, they had 11 stores. In 91 to 2000, the next decade, they jumped from 11 to 103 stores. The decade after that, to over 300. 2013 to 2014, now that's only two years there, they added another 200 stores. 2014 to 2015, they added another 100 at 600 stores. By the end of 2016, they were at 700 stores, 800 by the end of 2017, and, and today they're at over 900 stores. I, as I've said before in, in other videos, just Google Harbor Freight and then click the news uh, tab there. And what you're going to get is store opening, store opening, store opening, store opening. They're moving into a lot of these nice new uh, retail locations, kind of like the one you see behind me. But they're also taking over a lot of older stores and, and moving in and picking up where other retailers left off, if you will. Now, this may seem like a lot of stores, but keep in mind, somebody like, say, Ace Hardware has 5,000 locations across the U.S. To be fair, however, Harbor Freight is 100% corporate-owned, whereas Ace is a franchise, meaning they don't have to come up with the capital themselves to open all these stores. Harbor Freight made a real name for itself across the years by selling their own branded tools. These were, as I said, tools that they contracted with these... Uh, these manufacturers in China to sell directly to consumers here. They created in-house brands like Chicago Electric, Central Pneumatics, Drillmaster, uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Pro. 
uh, some some names that became you know synonymous to uh, budget tool users. In recent years, however, they've moved to create a prosumer market with brands like Bauer and Hercules, not to mention the Pierce and Banks nail guns, and don't forget those Daytona Jacks. They've been really trying their best to move into the next level of consumer markets, or as we often call it, the prosumer markets, where it's not quite professional, but not, you know, a little bit better than, you know, your typical consumer grade. Now, they will advertise these brands as being professional grade, of course, because they're trying to make you feel like the average DIYer can get a professional grade tool. And maybe they're even hoping that some of the lower end professionals will choose to go with their brands. You know, let me show you a quick comparison. Okay, what we got here is our, shall we say, our family list of tools. On the left, we've got the Stanley Black & Decker family, and that's DeWalt, Porter Cable, and Black & Decker. And on the right, we got TTI with Milwaukee, Rigid, and Ryobi. Yeah, Rigid's actually owned by Emerson, built under contract, but it still fits into this family view. Basically, what this is called is Goldilocksing where you've got this one's too expensive, this one's too cheap, this one is just right, where they try to give the, uh, the consumer a, a range of tools based on their needs so they can find out which one of the three bears or which one of the tools falls into their category. Harbor Freight's trying to do the same thing these days, and they've slid in here with their Hercules, Bauer, and Warrior brands. And they're trying to equate, as you've seen in their ads, they've trying to equate the Hercules with the DeWalt. That would put the Bauer up against the Porter Cable and the Rigid and the Warrior in the Black and Decker and Ryobi zone. However, that's not quite exactly how this is working out. If we're going to be completely honest, it would probably look more something like this. With the Hercules falling in, probably not even quite, but close to the Rigid and Porter Cable line, and the Bauer more equivalent with the Ryobi and the Black & Decker. And honestly, I think the Bauer would be pretty close to the uh, the Black & Decker, probably not quite up to the Ryobi. And in the Hercules line, it'd probably be the same thing. Pretty close to the Porter Cable, but not quite up to the Rigid, especially if you consider Ridge's lifetime warranty. And the poor little warrior is in timeout over in the corner. Now... I did. I don't mind the Warrior. I, I used it for that deck project I showed you uh, back at the house up in Montana. Uh, it was a small little outside project. And for around the house, for your general basic budget-minded DIYer, the Warrior's just fine. But it's not a tool line. There's the tool, there's a flashlight, and there's an, an extra battery you can buy. Yeah, they've branded some other tools Warrior, but they're plug-in. They don't use the batteries. So if it doesn't use the same battery amongst the whole, you know, other tools, or even if there are other tools, it's hard to consider it a line. And that, in reality, is where Harbor Freight falls into this, you know, Goldilocks zone. They're trying to get to that prosumer level. They've definitely upped their game, but the prices have gone up along with it. And while we may question some of the choices, like Hercules trying to compare itself up against DeWalt and Milwaukee, there's no doubting the fact that a lot of these lower-end prosumers like Bauer and such have a lot of appeal to the DIY market and have been, by all accounts, quite successful. In fact, do you want to know how successful Harbor Freight has been at this? Eric Smith currently has a net worth of an estimated $4 billion. That's billion with a B. Just to give you some backstory, he's, he's not some rich kid who, who had money thrown at him to create this business. In fact, he did not have the easiest of upbringings. Shortly after he was born, his mother came down with MS and his father trying to handle with, you know, paying the bills, taking care of the house, taking care of his wife and a young son couldn't handle it all and dropped his son at age nine off at the local orphanage. Eric lived at the orphanage for four years before moving in with his aunt in Tennessee. He lived there for two years before moving back home. He was back home for about a year when on his 16th birthday, he moved out of the house and into his own apartment. Now remember, he started Harbor Freight at age 17, graduating high school at around age 18. That's a guy who's a, who's a go-getter. He's, he's out there hustling. He's had to work hard to make the money he has. His yacht here, I think it's called Infinity, or when he's flying around, he's a, he's a licensed uh, jet pilot flying around in his G650. Yeah, I... I should roll some audio of that 
like a G6 here, but I know uh, I get copyright strike for that sort of thing. Thanks, YouTube. That is to say that Eric came into his wealth the old-fashioned way. He earned it. He worked hard for it. And we have all these lovely Harbor Freight stores to thank for it. Now, I'll be the first, you know, I'm a Harbor Freight fan, but I'll be first to admit that not all Harbor Freight tools are great. There's a lot of them that are complete junk. There are a lot of them that are excellent deals that are really good tools for the DIYer and maybe even for, you know, some of the, you know, professionals out there. I know there's a lot of welders who, who use those inexpensive Harbor Freight grinders all the time. And, you know, I'm a big fan of their 12-inch uh, sliding miter saw, the the dust collector, the, the big two horse, horsepower dust collector is a basically a industry standard in DIYer shops across the U.S. Harbor Freight ha, has a warm and special place in our heart and they continue to grow. Week after week I see more and more stores opening as I, I check the, the news announcements. And I hear lots of you complaining that there's no good Harbor Freights near me or I gotta drive an, you know, an hour to get to local Harbor Freight. Fear not, at this rate of growth, it probably will only be a year or two before you have one just down the street from you. Anyway, there you go. There you have it. That's our brief history of Harbor Freight. Why don't you comment down below what your favorite Harbor tool is. Tell us why you like it and uh, what you think of it. Or maybe comment what your least favorite Harbor Freight tool is. Anyway, that's all the bear has for you today, guys and gals. You take care, and as always, shine on. I want to say a big shout out and thank you to Jeff King, the publisher and author of the Home Distillers line of books. I hear he helps save drowning puppies in his spare time. He's been known to fix the wing of a wounded swan and, and give candy to children. What, what a marvelous guy. I can't say enough about him.